Ever since I saw images like this, I realized you could get some amazing graphics in CGA with just four colors by alternating pixel colors and doing cross hatching and various dithering techniques. This one's a bit of a cheat. It actually has some anti-alias lines and various other features that you couldn't get on a CGA monitor. Apparently this was done with something called Famicam 64, whatever the hell that is. But I think this is representative of what we should be able to get on a CGA monitor. And I've actually got a few ideas that might even improve on this. In fact, retro graphics are really on vogue at the moment. And while researching for this video, I stumbled upon this CGA Jam competition. They had to design games using any game development platform they wanted, but they had to stick to the CGA graphics palettes. And some of the examples here are really astonishing. Uh, take a look at this one here, for example. Really fantastic work. And there's lots of examples of really excellent dithering throughout this. They got 115 different submissions to this competition. And there's a link in the description if you want to check it all out. One that really impressed me was this example on Michael Nolan's blog. He did this for CGA Jam and apparently he used Unreal Engine 4. And this has a really stunning effect. If you want to check this out, there's a link in the description to his blog. This all got me wondering whether there's a way of automating the process of converting a full color JPEG image into a CGA palette. And I found this website called the Dithertron, which actually does this. Uh, it even has options for changing the brightness and contrast so you can get the image looking the way you want. And there's also a color option as well. Uh, it works much better if you have a lot of the colors in your original image that are CGA colors or very close to them. Uh, there's also a dither option here. Sometimes dithering can leave a lot of bright pixels which stand out in the image. And if you drop the dither option, those will disappear to some degree. And uh, then you might have to fiddle with the color option to get it looking uh, a little bit more pleasing again. Uh, but this supports a whole range of different machines and even supports the other CGA palettes. But unfortunately, if none of the colors in the original image match any of the CGA colors in that palette, then you're going to get a very bland image. And it really doesn't matter if I fiddle with the color or dither options here, I'm still going to get black and white. Uh, there is a kind of perceptual filter instead, and that gives a much better result. Uh, so I reckon this is a great way of getting images for games and CGA demos. Another very flexible way of converting the image is to use the GNU Image Manipulation Program, which is free software that you can download. There's a link in the description for that. You just load in the image that you want to convert, and I'm just using this free image by Annie Spratt. There's a link to the website where I got that as well. And the first thing we're going to do is to scale this image so that it's 320 by 200 since it's too large for a CGA monitor uh, in its current format. And uh, the next thing we need to do is to zoom it back in so that we can see it. And what I'm going to do is go to Image Mode Indexed and I'm going to select Generate Optimum Palette and set the number of colors to four. And there's also various dithering options I can select. And I'll select Floyd Steinberg, which I'm actually going to discuss later in the video. And when we do a convert, we'll end up with a four color version of the image. Now it doesn't look quite right yet, so I need to create a CGA palette. So I go to the palette option and I find the color map of the image and right click it. And then I duplicate the palette and then I double click on each of the colors and I can modify them. So I'm going to set these to the hexadecimal values for CGA, which you can actually find on the Wikipedia website for CGA. Uh, so red would be FF5555 and then I'm going to set green which is 55FF55 and finally uh, I'm going to select the yellow color which is FFFF55 and now I have a CGA palette and in order to apply it to this image I go to colors map set color map and I just need to look through for the palette that we just created and it'll actually apply that to the image. It doesn't look really realistic here, but with a little bit of fiddling with the original image and all of the options, you can get this to look reasonable. 
I'll show you some images from a few years ago that I made using this technique, but you've got to choose the images carefully, otherwise it's not really clear what they're meant to be. This is supposed to be a grandfather clock and some doors into a rustic style room, but I think it's pretty hard to imagine what the original image looked like. If you pick the image fairly carefully and maybe even fiddle around with the background colour, you can get something that looks a little bit better. Sometimes the images can look quite artistic. This is meant to be a river scene, but I have to say that the clarity of the image is not really that great. But why stick with boring old full-colour CGA? I found this amazing image on Reddit. I know, right? Something useful on Reddit. It uses all 16 of the CGA colours, and you wouldn't normally expect to see those on the screen at the same time unless you used a really low resolution, hacked up tax mode. But it got me to thinking, Recently, I made a video about a game I was writing, and I discovered that if you change the background colour, you can get the appearance of a whole load of additional colours in ordinary CGI. So if this video gets more than 500 likes, I'll write some code for converting ordinary colour bitmap files down to CGI that uses this background colour trick and some dithering. And I also discovered recently on our sister channel, PC Retro Programmer, that one of my CGA cards actually has a special hidden mode that has way more than the usual four colours. So I'll also write some code for doing dithering on that card as well, so we can see what that looks like. So if you want to see that in a future video, hit the like button below. But what about 16 colour EGA? Surely we can get some stunning results there. And yeah, going back to the dithertron, it looks like we can. In EGA mode D, we can get 32200 resolution with 16 colours. So I'm going to download a few of these in binary format, and then write some code to load this up on genuine hardware. But while I'm doing that, how does this dithering work anyway? As you probably figured out already, one of the main ideas behind a lot of these dithering algorithms is to pick the colour in the available palette that's closest to the original pixel colour. But this results in large areas that are basically all the same colour because that was the closest colour for all of those pixels. So now let's turn on Floyd Steinberg dithering and the result looks so much more realistic. So what it's doing is picking the nearest colour but then it's figuring out what the difference is between that and the original colour and pushing that difference out to all of the neighbouring pixels. So if you had to round down to get that particular pixel, then all of the neighbouring pixels would be rounded up a little bit. And this has the effect that if you have pixels that are sort of halfway between two available colours, it'll end up alternating between the two. One will get rounded down, the next one will get rounded up, then the next one will get rounded down, and so on. And this just looks so much more pleasing to the eye, at least from a distance. But there are other approaches as well. For example, the one that ends up with a kind of crosshatch pattern in the result. This usually comes from ordered dithering, and to see how it works, imagine a gradient from one of the available palette colours to another. One way of doing that would be to start out with a block of pixels all in the first colour, and then for each step in the gradient, just turn one of the pixels to the second colour in a fixed order in the block, until you finally get to the point where all the pixels are in the second colour. Now to approximate something like that in an image like this, it turns out to be equivalent to adding a fixed block of numbers called a Bayer matrix to this image. So for example, this one was done with an 8x8 Bayer matrix, and so each 8x8 block of pixels gets that added to it, and then you just pick the nearest colour in the palette. So this gives a really pleasing result because of the ordered nature of it. It also does great things with straight lines and it's cool for animation because there's very few artifacts. But it's also really fast. It's just adding some numbers to the pixel colors and then choosing the nearest one in the palette. Another approach which you've almost certainly seen before is halftone dithering. So this starts out with a background in one of the colours, and then you add dots of varying sizes in a second colour. So as the dots get bigger, you end up with more of the image coloured by the second colour, and this ends up with a really pleasing result. Even zoomed in, it looks really fantastic to the eye. And there are lots of other approaches as well. One of the early attempts was just to add random noise to the image following a certain mathematical distribution. But there are other approaches as well, such as adding certain patterns to the image, 
which makes it look more regular and more pleasing to the eye. Well, overnight I managed to write a program for loading EGA graphics from the Dithertron for EGA mode ODH. Everything went more or less according to plan. Each of the bit planes is stored in a separate 8000 byte block, but unfortunately they have the bit order within the bytes reversed. So I had to write a little conversion program to fix that. But now that it's working, it looks great. And this is on a genuine IBM EGA card, by the way, with just an IBM 5153 monitor. So let's dither a few more graphics and check them out. This is the cat that we dithered earlier, and this looks far better than I could possibly have imagined. This Dithertron does an absolutely astonishing job with the dithering. I'm really pleased to have found it. This log cabin probably looks better on camera than it does in real life, but it still looks fantastic. The light tree on the left hand side doesn't dither very well, and the grass in the foreground looks a bit speckly, but that might be possible to fix with an adjustment in the Dithertron. Wow, this teapot scene by Eduardo Froza is amazing. I think I left the best to last. The cabin was by Oliver Guellard, the cat by Cedric VT, and the retro scene by Lorenzo Herrera. Thanks to all the photographers who made their work available under an almost public domain license. Before I go, I thought I'd show some old DOS games that do make good use of dithering. It's actually really easy to find DOS games that use a kind of patterned fill, but ones that actually use dithering in the graphics as a kind of artistic technique, it's not so easy to find those. So Double Dragon is one really good example of this. Although there is a lot of repetition in the graphics, probably to keep the size down when packed on a disc, it's obviously been done by an artist with some kind of dithering approach. Of course, the quintessential DOS game with dithering is Defender of the Crown. The graphics in this are just amazing. Just everything in the game is illustrated so beautifully. Just take a look at these graphics. Uh, this must have taken someone absolutely days to get right. If you've not played this game, I highly recommend it. It's a whole load of fun. It's a little bit hard in terms of controlling the characters, but it really is worth it just for the fantastic graphics. And of course, who can forget California games? These guys pulled every trick in the book to get the most out of the CGA card, including the change of palette so that you get more than four colors on the screen at one time, and also the dithering, which you can see to great effect in the foreground, especially on the track itself. A couple of other fun things before we go. I don't think my mother realized that the topic of this video would be dithering, or she might have chosen a slightly different pattern for this, but she's been hard at work programming her knitting machine to create the PC Retrotech beanie. So show some love in the comments for her efforts, will you? Speaking of fans of the channel, those of you who are still watching, I'm planning on having a deep dive on this smart EGA card which I bought recently. If you'd like to see anything dithered on this, leave a note in the comments below. But remember I can only use very permissively licensed or public domain images. And again, YouTube will delete any links. So perhaps just leave the name of the website where you found it, the name of the photographer, and perhaps what dither settings you used, and we'll give it a go. And likewise, if you know any games that are really good in the dithering department, either on EGA or CGA, then maybe also mention that as well, and we'll give those a try on this card. Of course, I'll use that with a real EGA monitor, so we'll actually have the higher resolution stuff. And I think that's going to be really something to look forward to. Anyway, that's it for this week, so thanks very much for watching, and we look forward to seeing you in a later video. Don't forget to like and subscribe.